Let's stand up for the reading of the Word of God. Let's open up our Bibles to the um, book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Um, for the last couple weeks, if you've been missing, we've been going verse by verse through the Pauline epistles. And we start off in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to go through, Lord willing, through the whole Pauline epistles, uh, verse by verse, and, and do a lot of flipping and turning, and just to, just to uh, fill in the picture and see what we can get out of it. And um, we're right now we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And we're just going to read through verses 1 through 13. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good re remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. For now we live, if, we st if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. Bow our heads ask God's blessing. Uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, first off, it's always great to be saved, Lord. And uh, we just thank you so much for the gift of salvation, Lord, that you died on the cross and shed your blood and resurrected the third day for us, Lord. Mm -hmm. We're so grateful for that, Lord. And just uh, like we sang this morning, Lord, just help each and every one of us to trust and obey, Lord. That's where true happiness is found and true joy. And so we can bear fruits in the Holy Spirit, Lord. Allow us to trust you, Lord, and lean on you, especially in these times that we're living in. Uh, dear God, I pray that um, you just open up our eyes to the Scripture, Lord. Your word's perfect. There ain't nothing wrong with it. There's something wrong with us, there, Lord. And uh, we, we need help, dear God. We need help for understanding. I pray for the gift of teaching here this morning. And uh, just open up our eyes and hearts to your word, Lord. And just uh, bless everyone that, that, that's here, Lord, and, and those that, that are not here. I pray that you be with them this morning and minister to their needs. Comfort them, Lord, and uh, just establish them in, in, in your grace, Lord. You're, you're so graceful and, and merciful toward us, Lord. You really are, Lord. We take a lot of things for granted. Very spoiled around here, dear God. And we just thank you for every little thing, Lord. Allow us to take this morning to just uh, be grateful and just um, keep us covered in your precious blood, Lord. And um, bless your holy word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And you may be seated. So, um, real quick, a real brief rundown. Talking about the Apostle Paul. Okay? And um, if, if you're not familiar with it, the Bible, you've got to rightly divide the Bible. Okay? You've got to rightly divide it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work meaning not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Bible is broken up into, into certain periods of time, okay? And the key to unlock the Bible is to get each verse in the correct period of time, okay? And who is that verse addressing? Okay, there's groups of people in the Bible. There's a Jew, there's a Gentile, and there's a church. Right there, you got to make the division. Things that are different are not the same. you got to split them apart, okay? Every verse has its proper dispensation of time. And that's the problem, all right? A lot of problems with many people say, well, why are there so many denominations and so many, you know, this is your, just your interpretation, and well, this, this is what I think, and this is what you think, and all that. Look, you take the Bible, it means what it says, and says what it means, and there's no contradictions in the Bible if you get the verse in the proper place. And all the false doctrine that's tied out there in the world today, which we're told to watch out for, all that comes from is taken from a verse in a different dispensation and applying it to here. For example, taking something from the law and applying it to the church age, or taking something that's happening in the tribulation, such as the mark of the beast and all that, and, and trying to apply it to here, or, Something that's going to happen in the millennium when Christ returns and applying it over here. The good saying is that every every uh, every false doctrine is a truth just misplaced. You got to watch out for that. So we're studying the Apostle Paul, who wrote 14 books. 13, I believe, he wrote the Book of Hebrews also. 
14 books the Apostle Paul. It's over half of the New Testament easily. Um, we're going to see that the Lord dispensed a lot of things to Paul, such as the doctrines of salvation, justification, regeneration, all of the, the mysteries, the six, six mysteries that were revealed to Paul. We're going to go through all those. Now, uh, as we said, um, starting Thessalonians, that this is the, the first book that you've got to get in the hands of the new convert. Because it, it, it sums up a lot of good practical things and a lot of good uh, simple doctrinal things. Okay? It talks about Christian conduct and what we're to be waiting for, what we're to be looking for. Every chapter mentions the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you want to establish every new Christian you know, to go in. And it's a short book. So I encourage everyone to, to you know, go ahead and read that, read that thing a couple times. Read it over and over again. It's very short. So this is the book that you want to read, especially for new converts. And um, we're going to start off in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now this chapter is pretty much taken up with personal matters. And deals with Paul and Timothy and their problems uh, and dealings with the new converts. So um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Wherefore we could no longer forbear... Okay, that's the stop to delay or to abstain. We, we can no longer forbear. We thought it to be good left at Athens alone. All right, now we've got to park here for a while, and we've got to come to the book of Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. If you're using a Bible in the, in the pew, that's page number 1463. 1463. 1463. Now, um, you know, once again, you always got to emphasize how you get the true meaning of scripture is not a private interpretation, but you got to do some flipping and turning. You got to do some work at it. You got to get a little workout in your Bible, which we should be doing all week long. We should be familiar with something. We should be reading. This is a new year. Like I always tell you, know, people are all worried about physical goals and I'm going to do this. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get this job promotion. And, you know, I said, oh, I'm going to flip over a new leaf and turn this over. Well, how about setting some spiritual goals? You know, try to get through the Bible. Try to read through the Bible every day. Read a proverb every day, you know. Keep, a, keep the devil away. <laughs> read read, uh, read a, a book in the Old Testament and a book in the New Testament. You know, set some spiritual goals. I'm going to witness more. Pray for, pray for the Lord to open up do doors and to give you the utterance to, to preach to people. I'm going to pass out more tracts. Start setting some spiritual goals. That's the stuff that really hurt, holds the eternal weight when we get up to glory. All this materialistic stuff. Now, um... Speaking of materialistic, naturalistic people, we're going to get into the chapter in Acts chapter 17 here. But let's look at Acts chapter 17, starting at verse uh, 13. Because Paul does say in 1 Thessalonians 3, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. So look what happens. Let's fill in this time frame here. Acts chapter 17, verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, I, we're reading the book of Thessalonians. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. They're always after Paul. We're going to see why Paul comes with all these afflictions and persecutions and stuff. They're after Paul. Verse 14. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they had conducted Paul, brought him unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. All right, Paul sent Timothy somewhere. Paul most likely sent Silas somewhere. Uh, it says, if you look at Acts 18, 5, I'm going to turn there, but Timothy went to Macedonia. And they get re reunited. But Paul's alone here, okay? Come to verse 16. Okay, we've got to talk about a little bit about Athens. This is going to get, this is going to get kind of, you know, kind of get, you know, divert off the of Thessalonians here. We're going to spend a little time in the book of Acts chapter uh, 17. And this is idolatry in uh, the Greek philosophers, Okay. So look at uh, Acts 17, 16. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens. Okay, Paul was alone. While Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. Okay, his spirit was stirred as the first time you see. Well, why was it stirred up? When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. That whole city was given to idols. That's almost like modern day America. You walk around, and everybody got an idol. Everybody knows the, the latest trend and the latest fad and the latest thing on uh, in Hollywood or, or sports people, athletes, whatever. Um, but then it's interesting how it says "wholly given to." That's the definition of, of a holic. If you're an alcoholic, you're wholly given to alcohol. Okay? They're like idol idol holics almost. Okay? They're wholly given to their idols. That was their crafts. That's what they did. That's how they made a living too. In the moment where Paul was saying. Quit doing this stuff, you know. And then Paul talks about Thessalonians. He rejoiced because they turned 
they turned to God away from all their idols. And you see that a couple people that withstood Paul and said, Paul, I can't, I can't get rid of my idols, so I make a living. I'm making these statues of gods and stuff, and you're telling me, you know, to get rid of all this stuff, how am I going to make a living? And, and Paul, uh, Paul said, you got, you got to quit it. You can't do it. It's not pleasing to the Lord. These, these people were wholly given to idolatry. It's interesting that the New Bible say uh, the city was, uh, was full of idols. Just full of idols. But that's calling out the people that they were wholly given to idolatry. It's a lot, holds a lot more weight to it in the King James Bible. Now, um, now we're going to find here when we go out that there's going to be two teachers. You know anything about philosophy? You got Ep Epicurus and, and Zeno. Zeno was the founder of, um, of, of Stoicism. Okay, and uh, Epicurus was. Um, uh, we're going to see that they were the Epicureans. And uh, so around this time in Athens, this is where philosophy was big. You got your 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 philosophical fathers. You got Plato. You got Aristotle, and Socrates, and all them people. And um, look at verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue. So he wasn't just preaching; he was disputing with them. There's almost like debates going on. Okay. We are told to contend for the faith. That's why we're told to study, so we can answer every man. And, and, to, uh, and to know, you know, what they believe in and how to disprove it. How to reprove them and rebuke them. So Paul, he disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. And in the market daily with them that met him. Now, it's interesting because uh, Acts 20, Paul was teaching publicly and he was teaching house to house. And we're going to see Paul, this is a pub, Paul's publicly preaching here. Now look at verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, followers of uh, uh, Epicurus, the Epicureans and of the Stoics, follower of, uh, of Zeno, okay? Zeno of, of, uh, of, Sid of Sidium. Okay, and now just to talk about that, the Epicureans, they taught a philosophy that's pretty much akin to what's called hedonism. <coughs> now I went to uh, Penn State and Kensington, secular school, and I took, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I took the class of philosophy, okay? As a, as a Bible-believing Christian. Now, you know what you're going to, you know, I'm taking a religious, I uh, took another class of religious uh, history in America. Thinking, what, I was going to learn Bible there or something? No way in the world. You know, first day of class at public school, that, that Unitarian guy stands up there and says, I, I, the, the Trinity is, I don't believe in the Trinity. First day of class, he denounces the Trinity. He says, God, Christ was just another man. He ain't God. He ain't God incarnate. First day. So once again, in this philosophy class I'm taking, first day of class is, uh, you know, we get he gets us in groups and stuff, and he says, define the word sandwich, okay? Define the word sandwich, and it turns out that you can't have a you couldn't have a definition for the word sandwich. Some people say, well, it was a piece of bread with something in the middle and, and another thing. Well, another person said, well, you can take the one piece of bread and fold it and have something in the middle, or it could be a cars sandwich into each other. Each other it doesn't have to be calling here. All this stuff. The bottom line is, man, that set the tone for the whole class. You know, there's no definitions. <laughs> there's no definitions in philosophy. Words are like nothing but abstractness and you, you know, relativism. You think it means this and you think it means that. It's just like like the, what Paul says: ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They can't get grounded in absolute truth. This is right. This is wrong. You know, they didn't. They don't. You can't even put a definition on what good is in. In, in philosophy, you, that's that's how they work. That's how they operate. Now, if you're curious, they taught a philosophy which uh, which like he, uh, hedonism, uh, which pretty much is reduced to the bare essentials, which means uh, pleasure is the greatest intrinsic good and pain is the uh, greatest intrinsic bad. So therefore, if it feels good, then do it. That's that's pretty scary. That reminds me. If you study a little bit about Satanism, the guy named Aleister Crawley, their main thing in Satanism is do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Do what you do what you want to do feels good do it. Now where do you stop with that? Where do you stop? You know, that, that could get far off, okay? If it feels good, do it. That's scary. Now, um, Zeno, he taught, uh, he taught something that was um, pretty much taught the endurance of pain or hardships without the display of feelings or emotions. Right? They were teaching self-control uh, as a means of overcoming destructive emotions. Now keep in mind, these philosophers, no sin, no hell, uh, no certainty of the afterlife. All naturalistic materialists. Everything that they, everything that you can see and taste and touch and feel, that's all they believe in. And uh, that's like a lot of people today, when you think of it. So a lot of people are. The same spirit in Athens is present today. Okay, like agnostics. They don't know. You know, I can't tell you for certain. 
There's no absolutes. Now, that's what I always tell you. you know, the first day of class, you learn it probably in high school, yeah. teach you about the theory of relativism. Okay? Well, there's no such thing as absolutes. That, that's the scariest thing you can get into. Because then you turn into your own God. You're not into uh, subjection to anything. You're not, under, you're not under a power of nothing else. It's just, well, whatever I think is right, I'm just going to do it. Well, that's what the devil said. You shall be as gods. And people want to be their own personal God all the time. You've got to be into subjection, into, a, into a absolute truth and final authority in God's word. Now, uh, he disputed with these people certain philosophers, verse 18, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics. Okay, encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? First, first instance of a, a Christian preacher. What's this babbler going to say? He's just going to sit up there and talk and just run his mouth off for an hour, you know, hour long. What's this babbler going to say? That's how they looked at Paul. A lot of Christians get looked at that today, especially the preacher. Okay, and um, now it's interesting. What would this babbler say? Now, you know what? If you hold your hand in Acts 17, I'll just read it. I'll read it because it's interesting. 1 Corinthians. Corinthians were falling for this Athenian stuff. 1 Corinthians, hold your hand in Acts 17. But 1 Corinthians, that's page 1511. 1 Corinthians 18.21. Okay, right away. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 18. Um, well, even verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. Which a lot of those Athenians, they elevated that vocabulary and sophistication and your speeches and your oratory skills and all this stuff. Yep. Okay, with, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. All the emphasis goes back on the Lord. Not some man, because he can speak so good and he flatters my ears and makes me feel good and everything. It's not about that. It's not about man's, you know, intellectual capability. It's about the power of the cross. It's about Jesus. Look at verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Okay, so those people in Athens, they were perishing as they sat there debating all every day and night. They're perishing. So next thing you know, they come up, what's this babbler going to say? They're already dismissing it like he's just a fool. It's just foolishness. Look what he said. Look at verse 18. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Notice the contrast. In verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Um, uh, look at verse 21. For after, in that, uh, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You could be the smartest rocket scientist, brain, neurosurgeon, whatever, and yet not know God. Look at it. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Sometimes you're made to look like a fool for Christ. You know, thank the Lord he, he revealed these things unto babes, like the Jesus Christ said. And them, them highly religious, educated doctors of the law, Pharisees, they said they can't even get this stuff. I gotta reveal this stuff unto babes, unto people that are base, okay? You might not know how to, to, to do nothing else in life, but if you could preach the gospel, that's a big thing. The Lord uses those types of people. Big time. I'm a I'm a big witness to that one. Not much else I know how to do. <laughs> but the but the but the Bible, that's a big deal. You know, I was thinking most people know what's better the inside of a car hood than they do what's the inside of the Bible. This is the stuff what what holds more weight to it. It's eternal. You know, I was thinking I think of eternity. Um, look at verse uh, Acts 17, back to Acts 17, 18, uh, Acts 17, 18. What will this babbler say? Okay. Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. That's what, them, that's what them philosophers are saying. He seems to be sent forth strange gods. Now it's interesting. Obviously Paul was preaching the Trinity. He was preaching the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Right away, you talk to an unsaved person, they come up to you and say, well, you're, you're worshiping three gods. They can't even understand the basic elementary term of what, it, what, it, what is a trinity? Well, it's three things composed of third one. Like this pulpit, length, width, and height. How many pulpits is it? It's one pulpit. You're one person, but you look yourself in the mirror, you're composed of a body, soul, and spirit. Okay? So right away, these Athenians, they said, now, now he's, they think he's preaching, he's a, what is it, a polytheist. He said, for strange gods. Okay? And um, because... He preached unto them Jesus in the resurrection. So that's Jesus Christ dying for their sins. That was foreign to them. They couldn't wrap their head around that. Now look, look what they have to say, verse 19. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus. So in other words, they called him a babbler, and they're like, well, come, come with us. We're, we're, we'll give you some fair time. Come to Areopagus, we'll go up to Mars Hill. That's like taking, your, you know, taking a preacher and going into the Capitol building or something and 
letting him portray his case or something like that. That's all I picture it. Taking him down to the Washington, D.C. and have him dispute this stuff. And they took him and brought him into Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? They wanted to know it intellectually. Explain to me how somebody's going to resurrect from the dead. Explain to me how God poured out all his wrath for this thing you call sin. And how he poured out his wrath on his son. Explain this to me. You know, how, how does that work out logically? They're all about that logic and reason. They, here's the thing. They didn't know what faith was. They didn't know what faith was. What's the Bible say about faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please them. These intellectual, highly educated people, they couldn't please God if they tried. you got to have faith. Well, I, I can't explain to you how God, God of the universe, he flung out all this stuff, and next thing you know, he came down in the seat of a woman, and, 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 and he's God incarnate. That's a mystery. That's a mystery. God says it, so I'm going to believe it. I can't explain it to you with all my wisdom and formulas and Albert Einstein and MC Square. I can't break that down into formulas. No way. That's believing by faith, because God said it. Now look at verse 19. Now so they said, what do we know this new doctrine where if thou speakest this? Verse 20. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. We would know what these, what these things mean. What is this? Intellectually. Belief in that, it's about a heart issue. Not about everything you know in the head. Okay, it's that same thing, Christian, you go, watch yourself there. You know, especially us studying the Bible, you think, well, that's just all this head knowledge, I'll memorize this verse, and I'll just memorize that. When that gets all in the head, you got to let that thing embed down into your heart. It starts changing your motive of life. You start producing fruits, it starts working. Because why? Because you believe in it, like Paul said in Thessalonians. The Word of God only works in people, those, it only effectually works in those who believe. Look at verse 20. Um, in verse 21, for all of the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time, catch this, they spent their time in nothing else. They didn't know what laboring was, sweating, they didn't know about none of that. All they did every day, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's your modern day news media. That's all they do. They sit around and tell me what's new. What are you going to do tomorrow? What would you do today? Social media. What are you doing right now? What are you eating right now? What are you going to eat tomorrow? What are you going to do tomorrow? What's your future plans? Okay? Did you hear about this new iPhone that just came out? Did you hear about this new this new trend that just popped out on the scene? Hear about this new hairstyle? Hear about these new these new Bible versions? You know, you guys reading that old King James? Come on to the new the, the new Bible versions. You ever hear the you, you, uh, you old you, people in here singing them old time hymns? You know, old time religion. Come over here and sing. It's getting up new with the contemporary stuff. That new Christian Christian rock and roll. Christian rock and roll. Christian rap music. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to play some Christian rap music in here. I'm going to come in here and play you know, Christian rock and roll. I mean, come on. I, watch out for all that new stuff. That's the, that's the point. All this new stuff. The only thing that I'm concerned with that deals with new stuff is the New Testament, New Jerusalem. I know when I die, I'm going to have a new name written up in glory. That's the good stuff. That's the new stuff that I'm looking for. That's, that's way out there. You can't. You modern days news media, you can't catch up to this, to this Bible. That's all. That's that's what you gotta watch out for. Everything, all this new stuff, okay? And um, I, I, watch out for that. You know, the latest trends in fashion. People get hooked into that. So watch out for it. Just people that just want to hear it. They're busybodies, all day long, concerned in other men's matters. Just have nothing else better to do. We're just gonna hear and tell us some type of new thing, just to appeal their to their flesh. It's really what it is. And their emotions and stuff. Look at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, okay, right in the middle of this thing, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. He said, You guys are superstitious. You got to, you step on a crack, you break your mother's back, you walk under a ladder, and you know, and you're, you knock over the salt, you throw the salt over your shoulder, and black cat crosses the road, you know, I'm, I'm running the other way. Just, Americans are still superstitious to this day. You know, but now they went Catholics. They were very superstitious. Very superstitious people. Talk to, talk to some Catholics. Now, now modern Bibles, they, uh, they change that word. They, they make it say, you are too religious. And then Paul, Paul didn't say, you guys are superstitious. You know, they, they, the modern Bibles, they translate that and say that, well, Paul says, you're just too religious. You know, watch out for them modern Bibles. They're just trying to be politically correct. You know, they don't want to offend people. There's reasons why the stuff that's taken out of him and twisted and warped. Paul just put it right over the plate, waist high, so you can grab it. Sometimes it would convict him. He, he was bold with his speech. 
people, you know, would call them rude sometimes. Look at verse 23. He said that you're all you're just too superstitious. Verse 23. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. All right, I found an altar with this inscription: "To the unknown God." To the unknown God. Praise the Lord. I know my God. I know that He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He came down so I got a fellowship with Him. He came down as a man, walked this earth. You know, He had the same emotions. He who knew no sin, he became sin for me. To test it and try it in every point, you know, was tempted, yet without sin. I mean, praise the Lord, I could have fellowship with him. I, I, I could relate to him in a, in a certain sense. These people, they were worshiping an unknown God. Now, who would that be? I'd be like worshiping Allah. Well, who, where is he at? What do he do? I'd be worshiping like the 33 million deities in Hinduism. Well, where'd they go? What'd they do? Look at, their, look at the country of India. I think it ain't looking good. There are people starving and famished in there, and you're there cooking spirit dinners and setting them at the feet of statues. You got villages out there that are starving to death. That's it. That's satanic. You got people going in the Ganja River, scrubbing their skin to try to get rid of their 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 sin. Go in there and get in that filthy river there because you're filthy and rub off all that filth. That's a satanic thought to get into the Ganja River and start scrubbing your skin off like that. It's just unknown. You don't know, you don't know what the, you don't know these gods. Another example. It's like that guy that said a prayer a couple weeks ago in the Capitol building. In the name of Brahma, who's that? Where's, where's Brahma? And he was a, a what is it, a Methodist minister? A minister. Reverend. Reverend, okay. Christian. Saying all this you know, beautiful, eloquent prayer comes down to the end of it and says, in the name of Brahma, in the name of all the monotheistic gods, you know, he didn't say Jesus, not one time Jesus, you know. Watch out for all that stuff. You know, to watch the inauguration, all this God talk. God, God bless America, God this, God that. I'm Joe Biden, I'm going to the Catholic Church on Sunday. God, God, love God, God. Well, what God? That's what I'm always concerned with. That's why when you see Paul preaching and writing in his writings, he always made it clear, the Lord Jesus Christ. All this God talk, not one time did you hear the Lord Jesus Christ. He's gone. Jesus, he's gone. He's out the window. Just let, we don't want to offend anybody, remember that. We don't want to offend people and step on their toes, so we got to pray in the name of all these unknown gods. Three days later, Capitol building gets taken over. I mean, you know, look, look what happens. Our Lord's a jealous Lord. Our okay, a jealous God. So, you know, watch out for that. Our unknown God. So, um, now look what he says, though. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Paul never wanted people to be ignorant. He only wanted them to know things, okay? Okay, know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And Paul says that every, all the time. Christians, you know what? Don't be ignorant of certain things. He's saying it to these people. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, then Paul says, Him declare I unto you. He's going to expound them. I'm going to tell you who this God is. Okay? And um, you know what? It reminds me of a verse in Romans real quick. Um, uh, what is it? Romans 122. Um, Romans 121. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, the Athenians. I'm studying day and night. I, I know I'm a great reasonable, you know, I could do I could beat you in logic and you know science and all that stuff. Professing themselves to be wise, like college professors, yet what happened? Uh, yet they became uh, as fools. They became fools. And they changed the glory of, uh, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. In other words, they worshiped the creature more than the creator. So you see a lot of times in, in Athens, they were worshiping the, these men, you know, the, the spirit of Athenians. They were, look what men can do, okay? Oh, men, we build these big architectural beautiful buildings. Men, we chisel out these statues of naked people. We call them gods. We worship architecture. We worship arts and crafts and everything that we can make with our hands because... Man is the measure of all things. You know, that's that's what that's how they thought. That was their philosophy. Man's the measure of all things. When the Bible takes a negative view on mankind, the Bible steps on your toes, steps on my toes all the time. That's the purpose of it, because it keeps you low. It keeps you humble, it keeps you base. And say, man, I I, I got I'm gonna be judged one day. They didn't think about nothing like that. They didn't believe that you were gonna be accountable for your sins. And that's that's what they uh, they, they teach up even to this day. There's no accountability to God. Just run rampant, run wild, run lawless. So that's what it's like. Okay, so Paul is going to be, he's about to declare unto, unto them this unknown God, okay? He's going to tell them who it is. 
Let's look at verse 24. God made the world and all things therein. That's the best thing I do when you're trying to reason with people that are atheists or agnostics. You always go right back to creation. Where did all this stuff come from? All this material and stuff, you know? Well, nothing exploded. Well, what is that? That's not logical. You claim to be logical, objective, you know, scientific, empirical, and all that. Yet, you know, you want to just, you want to run away. You want to get God out of the equation. In the beginning, God, okay, created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, nothing exploded into everything. Well, what, what is that? Or, you know, evolution. You know, well, you know, we were once monkeys and we were once a fish flying, you know, sw swimming in the sea and the fish jumped out and had grew wings and started flying away and hanging on trees and stuff. You know, it's like, what is all this? You know, that takes a lot of faith. But if you study the course of human history, you want to be empirical about it. We've never seen a horse produce a, a giraffe. We've never seen a jaguar produce a cow. I mean, it's, it's things that they produce after their own kind. You're not monkeys. Therefore, what do they do? They change the image of God. Okay, image of God into a, a, a corruptible beast. Well, God, you know, God, we're not made in the image of God now, we're made in the image of a monkey. They're changing things, you know, they're running away from, from, uh, from the accountability to God. All right, now look what Paul starts off with. They, uh, God made the world in all things there, and seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So if you're saved, Paul says to the Corinthians, know ye not that your temple is, the, is, uh, is the, uh, where the Holy Ghost dwells. He's not all about buildings. He's not all about cathedrals and fancy things. He's, he's dwelling inside of you if you're saved. You got the Holy Spirit inside. Yeah. That's where the temple. Is. That's what the temple is. You don't dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath, and all things. That's the surest proof of God exists. Life. Life. Like I always draw that simple equation. What's more, what's more logical? You know, life equals life or nothing equals life. What's more logical? What do we ever see and witness? Life equals life. So therefore, God gives life. Well, God must have had it from, from eternity past. He must have always had it. Eternal life. It's what he promises to us. So therefore, he must have had it. So that's the shortest thing about, about there's a God. He giveth life and breath. To all things. All right, now verse 26. And hath made of one blood, one blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth. We're all one blood here. We're all come back from Adam. We all got ancestry. Go right back to Adam and Eve at the end of the day. And hath determined the times before appointed, and you got to get this, and the bounds of their habitation. Watch out for open borders and stuff like that. Same people that preach open borders and let's all come in and unite and just intermingle and everything. Same people they got fences around their property. You want you want you want some strangers sleeping and camping in your backyard? Talk about open borders, you know? And just open them all up. Let's open all these borders up and let's all just come together. Get the people that you know. Let's just what did the one of the popes said? Uh, I, I'm not concerned with building walls. I'm concerned with building bridges. Sounds sounds awesome, doesn't it? Sounds pleasant. We're building bridges. I did a little study last night. Bridge, bridges, bridge, anything, that don't show up in the Bible one time. If God wants you to build bridges, he'd be telling you about it. Walls, walls show up in the Bible. Wall and walls, what is it? Show up in the Bible 245 times. God's concerned with boundaries and borders. You gotta, you gotta, or else you're going to start losing standards. That's the whole point. You've got to set up walls, set up boundaries in certain things. And um, that's, a, that's a big deal. Same people that say, you know, forget about walls and boundaries. They got gates around their whole house. Private job, driver, you can't get on their property. They, they care about that. They're just hypocritical at the end of the day. Look at verse 27. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our beings. As certain also of your own poets have said, Paul knew about what their poets said. He was educated. He wasn't a dumb, ignorant Christian. He knew about what other people believed and stuff. All right, their own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. For as much as then... As we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead, that's like the, that's the Trinity, that's the, that's the whole Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. And at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. The guy's up there laughing at that. You silly people, you're worshiping stuff that don't got breath or life in it, dummy. But now, God now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Okay, now here's the message of repentance Paul squeezes in there. And look how you obviously know how this is going to end. A lot of people don't like that. Verse 31. 
Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Uh-oh. Don't judge me. Judge not lest you be judged. Don't, don't, don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? No, Paul says he's preaching a judgment message. Judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Praise the Lord for that. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, bang, right there, they, they lost them. They lost them. Some mocked, but here's a good thing. And others said, we were here the again of this matter. I will come back another day, maybe some convenient day. They come back and, you know, come, you know, talk to me. Those people could have died. They could have just missed the opportunity. They could have went to hell. At, this, at that opportunity, Paul's giving them the invitation. Now look at verse 33. And what did Paul say? Paul said, oh, I'm going to continue. I'm going to raise it. I'm going to get all hot-headed. I'm going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So Paul departed from among them. <laughs> okay, right, 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 wash it off. Right, wash the, the dirt off your shoes and go on to the next. That's the main thing I advise the young Christians. Is sometimes, you know, you, you're, you're pressing. You're, you're, why don't you believe this? Why don't you believe this? You, you know, choking in the neck. You better get saved, you know? <laughs> I, mean, come, I mean, yeah, we understand that. We get passionate like that. But sometimes the best thing to do is just to kind of depart. Yeah, other people are willing to hear you. We'll hear you again. You know, some people are going to—they're going to leave. But now, but look, how be it though? Certain men clave unto him and believe. So that's a good thing here. Among the which was Dionysus, there a woman named Darius, and others with them. So others actually believed in that. So let's go back to uh, First Thessalonians. Just a brief rundown on uh, on uh, the spirit of, of of Athens. Okay, and uh, real quick, actually, while we're, uh, while we're on that topic. Matter of fact, flip to uh, Colossians. Flip to Colossians. Colossians, that's page 1568. Now look at, look at Colossians. Paul, Paul remembered these philosophers, and he, and he gives the admonition, the warning to Christians, you better watch out for them. They didn't just cease to exist back in the day. They're still here today. Paul tells you to watch out for them. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. That's page 1568. I'm sorry, uh, Colossians 2. Uh, that's Colossians chapter 2, verse uh, 8. Thank you. Okay, this is something that uh, Paul says you got to beware. That's be aware of this thing. Okay, beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through three things you got to watch out for. Philosophy, in vain deceit. Okay, maybe four things. Philosophy, vain deceit. After the tradition, watch out for tradition of men, after, watch out for the rudiments of the world. The rudiments of the world. You know, a lot of your, your worldly people, they might not know who Epicurus is, or Zeno, or Socrates, but you got to watch out for them. They have similar ideology, similar philosophical beliefs in their head, whether they didn't hurt them or not, at the end of the day. They're just in the rudiments of the world, their daily routine. That's all that, you know, that's all that they know. They're just worldly. The rudiments of the world. Now, uh, what would the rudiments of the world be? Uh, here's what a lot of people, here's what they say. They may not quote intellectual people and philosophers or anything like that with logic, but they say this. The rudiments of the world. Well, everybody else does it. Everybody else does it. You know? Uh, well, we always have done it. Okay? That's one. Uh, it all depends how you look at it. They say that. Uh, you, you know, you, you'll know when to quit. You know, you'll know when enough's enough. Next thing you know, you, you know, you spend all your money and, and you're addicted to something, or yeah, you know when to quit. Uh, you got to make a living. They're talking about money. Um, there, there's no harm in it if it doesn't hurt anybody. So that's what they're doing. The, the main purpose line is that they're just trying to justify that something's wrong. They're trying to justify sin. They're trying to justify wrong and not upholding uh, righteousness. What is what is right? Tradition of men. That'd be uh, here's one. 11 a.m. Sunday service. I would. I'm going to just be a Christian for one to a, an hour and a half, and then I'm going to go home the rest of the week and just say, forget about it, you know, and come back in and get my daily dose of Christianity. The rest of the week, I'm just going to live like the devil and stuff. That's, a, that's like a tradition. That's not good. That's not good. Uh, you know, dying eggs bun, at bunny time. Santa Claus. Uh, good, good Friday. Um, you know, Godmother and Godfathers. That's just all tradition. Tradition of men. That's not Bible, you know. Especially of us raised, raised Catholics, you know, you know a lot about that. And then uh, it talks about Paul warns of philosophy. So, um, yeah, that's now let's move on with in Thessalonians. Okay, so that's just a brief rundown on the spirit of Athens, and we're told to watch out for all that. So 
So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, okay, he thought it'd be good to be left at Athens. Okay, now verse number 2. Okay, and sent Timotheus our brother. Now a Christian is three things. Okay, a Christian is three things to their fellow Christians. Uh, Timotheus our brother, a minister of God, and our fellow laborer. Alright, so we're, uh, every Christian is a brother, a minister, and a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. There's only so much, you know, that a, that a pastor can do. He needs some help. He, he, you know, you've he, he got to go to work. you got to do some other certain things. you got to get out there and you got to witness too. you got you got to read your Bible. You can't constantly rely on, on the preacher to, to just, you know, for everything. It's, it's about your personal relationship, your personal walk. We're, 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 to, we're to be fellow laborers together in the gospel of Christ. Now here's another one. Uh, here's why. To establish you, uh, establish you in the right, correct beliefs, the right doctrinal beliefs, the right way of conduct, the way of living. To establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So there's three things: your fellow laborer, um, a brother, and a, a minister. And we're to establish you and to comfort you in things. Okay. Now, um, now I could talk about this real quick. Uh, now, notice how he says the gospel of Christ. Now, just a, a thing, that wasn't the gospel in which Jesus Christ was speaking in his earthly ministry. You know, you got you to gotta rightly divide that stuff. you got to get it down. I can't just say, you know, repent you know, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand and stand up here and start preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's not going to do nothing for you. i got to preach the gospel, uh, Christ died for your sins, and was buried, rose again the third day. Because the kingdom was at hand when John the Baptist was saying that. You know, uh, then the Lord told him to, uh, to say that prayer. On earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven. Well, when's the kingdom coming? That's coming way over here. Thousand year reign. That's the kingdom of heaven. That thing got postponed 2,000 years later. And that's the kingdom of heaven. I can't just tell everybody repent. The kingdom of heaven's coming. We know what kingdom is actually about to come up after the rapture. The kingdom of the Antichrist is, is coming up. So you got to rightly divide the difference between the uh, the gospels. There's certain good news. Good news is good news. In the in the Bible, you got to write the divide that. And uh, just to run that down, um, Acts. Uh, going off the turn there, but the gospel that was delivered to Paul is the gospel of the grace of God. It's another title that it was used for. That's Acts twenty twenty four. Paul says in Romans two sixteen. Romans two sixteen, right on that word. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, Paul calls that thing my gospel because it was dispensed to him. Uh, Paul just didn't make this up, pull this out of left field somewhere. It was given to him by Jesus Christ. Now, a big one, we got to look at Galatians real quick. Just to get established on the gospel, the most important thing. A lot of, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're teaching, uh, well, the, 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 the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Come down to Kingdom Hall, and we're going to, you know, convert you, and you're going to be saved. The gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom, that's, that's the millennium. you got to come over, you got to keep reading, come to the Apostle Paul. Now, look at Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, that's page 1546. 1545. 1545. Galatians chapter 1, talking about the gospel. Galatians 1. Galatians 1.8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So you got to watch out for preaching another gospel. Any other thing that was given to Paul. Let's keep reading verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have received, let him be accursed. That's a strong, that's strong language. You know, you believe any other gospel, anything else to get you to heaven but the death, burial, and resurrection, Paul says you're accursed. You're damned. That's, that's as flat out as it gets. That's what Paul says. For do I now persuade men or God? But do I seek to please men? All right, for, and Paul says, no. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So afflictions are going to come. Persecution is going to come. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, they didn't teach Paul this. How to get it? But by revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord chose Paul and revealed to him the gospel of salvation. Uh, we should all be familiar with that. Let's just flip to it real quick. 1 Corinthians. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. 1 
1 Corinthians 15. This is the gospel that we're to labor in and we're to give to people. Right? You know, this is this is the gospel, not the everlasting gospel. That's another one. That's preaching the tribulation. But the gospel of the kingdom, that was for the kingdom. That was for if the Jews received Jesus Christ as the Messiah, he would have set up their kingdom right there. Come over to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives you the declaration of it. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Page 1527. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This is it, the declaration. Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep remembering what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For uh, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Died on the cross, shed his blood. Big deal, how he died. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was prophesied in the Old Testament. Suffering lamb that was going to come to make atonement. In that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Two admonitions. The gospel is according to the scriptures. And if you don't got the scriptures and if there's error in the scriptures, there's error in your Bible, well, how do I know I got the right gospel? How do I know anything at the end of the day? That's the whole thing uh, is the King James Bible. The error and infallible word of God. You know, you get all these other translations out there, and some things are taken out. There's, you know, one one moment Al Hanan killed Goliath, next moment David killed Goliath. Who killed Goliath? There's contradictions in it and everything. It's like, come on now. You know, you, you got one one break in the scripture, then you what happens? You get the spirit of doubt. Oh, I don't know what, what God said anymore. I don't know if we got it no more. You watch out for that. Um, back to Thessalonians. So that's the gospel. That's the one that they're all laboring in, in preaching and, and talking about. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Thessalonians 3, um, verse 3. Okay, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Okay, now Paul's saying, look, these afflictions, I'm I went through a lot of stuff. We'll read some verses on that, Paul. And this is, this is a, a good thing is when, when people are noticing what you're going through, the afflictions and troubles that you're going through in life, that's a big testimony on how other, on how other Christians look at that. You look at, you, you go through it and just complain and, and just, you know, I can't take it, I can't stand it, and, or, or you try to give some glory back to God. You always got to think about that because a lot of people get moved away from that. You know, oh, well, you're suffering so much and, you know, th therefore, I, I don't know if, if I want to, you know, be a Christian or nothing like that. I thought when I signed up to be a Christian and everything was just going to be, you know, smooth rolling and I'm, I'm great, you know. We're going to look at a couple verses on that. Let's actually look at 1 Peter. Now, no man should be moved by these afflictions. The rest of it says, For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. We better expect it. We better expect it. Now, watch out for all these prosperity teachings. You know, God wants you leaving here in a new Cadillac today. God wants you coming out here in a new pair of shoes today. God wants you, you know, dancing. You can have a mansion on five, you know, big hills, acre. He wants all that for you. Watch out for all that stuff. There, there, there's their soothsayers. They tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what's pleasing. Paul said, I'm not out to always please you. Now look at uh, 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Peter. Peter. Peter got this thing down. Look at 1 Peter. And it's amazing how these early Christians understood Christian suffering. And us modern Christians, the moment something happens, just, we're, we're just like, we're done. You know? We, we, just, we just tap out. We quit. You know, that's not, that's not it at all. So that's early Christians. I mean, that they they had the spirit. I, pray, I would have thought that all Christians would be like that at the end of the day. That's tough. It's hard, especially in the day and age we're living in. All oh, everything we got in America. Um, First Peter, five. First Peter five, um, nine. Even First Peter, five eight. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion walked about seeking whom he may devour. The devil wants to chew you up and spit you out, every one of us. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, lost people are going to, or a Christian is going to suffer the same trouble as a lost person. A Christian, you may not have enough money to pay your bills. You may not, you may not be, have enough money to get food on a table. I mean, we're appointed to the same afflictions. Um, but, always got a good, always good word, but the God of all grace, who hath called us in his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, I suffer a long time, after that ye have suffered a while, 
Look what he's going to do. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We're going to have glorified bodies one day. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be perfectly sinless. Not only have a sinless Savior inside of us, but this body, the old man, old wretched man that I am, that's going to be, that's going to be perfectly sinless. You have the mind of Christ. That's what we're to look forward to. We're going to suffer a little while, Peter said. You suffered a little while. It might be 70, 80, 90 years, whatever. But knowing that, you know, then Paul talks about the eternal weight of glory, which is laid out for us in eternity. Now, uh, back to 1 Thessalonians 3. That you should note that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Okay? For yourselves know that we are appointed there unto. So, another thing, it's like, it's like they're to be moved away from the promises of God. Okay, so when they see that Paul's going through all these afflictions, that they might get moved away, and it's tough for them to believe Romans 8.28. Let's look at Romans 8.28. Let's look at Romans 8.28. It's one of the hardest verses. It's easy to understand. It is certainly easy to understand. But one of the hardest verses to just to really take hold of that thing and to claim this verse. Romans 8.28. That's page 1497. Okay. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things... What's that mean? That means all things. <laughs> that means death, divorce, desertion, disease, uh, debt, riots, rumors of wars, wars, persecutions, famines, sword, perils. We know that all things work together for good. Man, Lord, how in the world is all this stuff going to work together for good? And we, we're all guilty of that. You see this poor little baby over there, he's suffering, he's dying. How, how is this all going to work out for good? Well, that was a little bit easier. Thank God if that baby dies, he's in eternity. He don't got to suffer through this present evil world. Okay, that's a big deal. But there's a lot of things in our daily life that we go about and say, man, Lord, how is this going to work out for good? And, let, and sometimes I don't, that people, you know, Christians go through certain things, like the Apostle Paul, for example. Um, you know, that's what gets me. You know, the modern day Christian would look at the Apostle Paul and think that he was a backslidden Christian that was out of the will of God. Our Apostle Paul. You say, why is that? He was in jail. Okay? Paul was in jail. He didn't leave back no inheritance for his children. He didn't have any children. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have a house. Didn't have church buildings. Didn't have campuses. Didn't have, um, uh, he didn't have nothing. Apostle Paul didn't leave back nothing. Didn't have no bank account. Didn't have no retirement funds. No insurance policies. Apostle Paul didn't have anything. You know, modern Christians would look at that and say, man, I got it. He must, have, he must have been doing something wrong. He was out of the will of God. And you think about that. What Jesus said in Acts, 7, or Acts chapter 9, He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. I'm going to show him these things that he has to suffer for my name's sake. Paul was right in the will of God. Not, not many people uh, like hearing that. But to the modern Christian, they think that he, you know, he, Paul was shipwrecked and famined and troubled left and right by his own countrymen. So... A Christian, I don't know that you can't always judge it by the physical circumstances that you're going through. Okay, you can be right in line in, in the will of God, but people are looking at you. That's your time to shine. That's your time to be a good testimony, saying, "Man, I got through this stuff not because of my own self-will or my willpower, but because of the power of God got me through it." Not myself. You know, you always try to get. You know, when you're going through that stuff, it's going to be hard. It ain't going to be easy. But we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. What are you going to do? Just love your wife on days when she's when she's cooking your dinner and taking your shoes and rubbing your feet and everything. But not love her through the thick and thin. From when you're when you're having troubles, may have disagreements and little arguments. You got to love them always. Same thing with God. God might dish out something troubling to you. Lord, I still love you. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know the Book of Job. Now um, look at another one. Let's look at uh. All right, we're back to 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. For verily when we were uh, with you, we told you before, okay, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Now, Paul isn't saying here he's suffering, oh, oh, Christians going through the tribulation. Now, uh -uh. you study the Bible, the word tribulation shows up all the time. Uh, the Jews, back in the old days, back over here, they were going through tribulation. Well, what's that mean? The tribulation of the time of Jacob's trouble was, was fulfilled? No way. Paul is just talking about daily troubles that Christians are going through. You're going to mm -hmm. suffer tribulation. Even as it came to pass, and ye know. I right, look at first, um, let's look at Timothy. Come to the book of Timothy. Look at, uh, what is it? 2 Timothy chapter 3, page 5, 1590. 2 Timothy 
chapter 3, okay, let's just look at verse 1. I ain't going to read the whole thing. But this is 2 Timothy 3, 1. Here's your forecast for tomorrow. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Okay, we, we, you know, that's the thing, same thing. All these Christians telling you things are going to get better, a great revival is going to break out, and all this. Paul talks about perilous times are going to come. Better expect it. Better expect it. Okay? And that's not to just say, well, what do we do? You know, get in our, hide in our room, put the blanket over our head, and, and we're just, oh, I'm just worried, I'm scared, I'm nervous. No. Okay, now that's the time to shine. So you look. Better get saved. Lord's coming back soon. Brethren, don't be ignorant of the times and seasons, like Paul says. So, um, you know, don't get all that, that attitude of self-defeat. It should motivate you even more to, to clean up something. I'm going to try to do, what, to do what's right. More focus. I mean, I may not be able to save the world, but I could sure try to save my fellowship with the Lord. That's a big one. But in the last days, perilous times shall come. Come down to verse, uh, come down to verse 12. So just like Paul says in, uh, in Thessalonians, that you're appointed to, we shall suffer tribulation. Look what he says here. Uh, verse 12. Yea, in all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. If we're trying to live godly, look what's going to happen. <coughs> shall suffer persecution. Alright, now, you know, you look at that, a lot of, you know, Americans, I was just doing the study, I heard a preacher uh, passed away, uh, 2016, Dr. Ruckman. You know, he always says that, um, what did he say? He said something like, uh, Americans, they might have their time to fulfill that verse. A lot of American Christians today, we're living lavish. We live in lavishly compared to a lot of Christians throughout the whole gen Middle Eastern Christians and the, getting their fingers cut off and getting their heads cut off. Americans, we don't got to suffer through all that stuff. Like, what that mean? Well, we got to watch out, you know. A time could come, a time could come, yet yeah, all live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He said a lot of American Christians, they might get their chance to fulfill that verse right there. Doesn't sound good, but uh, you still got to stay closer to God. Look at verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall get, they're just going to get better and better. It's going to be great revival. Don't say none of that. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's what's going to happen. Okay? It, within a lot of days, it should be great falling away. Not, not, a good, not a great cleaning up and great revivals are bust up. So it's, things are going to get slim. It might get a little tough. Now look at 1 Thessalonians. Back to 1 Thessalonians 3. Verse 4, he told you before that you should suffer persecution, even as it came to pass, and you know. All right, verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, as by some means the tempter tempted you, and our labor be in vain. They're led astray again. They're back into the world. Like Paul talks about his buddy, his old buddy Demas. Demas started off good. He got saved. He was right next to the Apostle Paul. Paul started getting in a little bit of trouble. You know, the Jews were slandering Paul, saying this guy, he's a, he's a mover of sedition. He's trying to overthrow the establishment, overthrow Judaism and all that, throw him in jail. His demons, what happened to him at the end of the ministry? Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So Paul's saying, you know, I, I hope that I didn't labor in vain. I mean, that's the whole thing. A, a preacher, that's why I praise the Lord for, some, for young people even. I know that a lot of older folks, they're, they're tough, they're set in stone. But the young people, they're still moldable. You can still, you know, you can still transform me and see them actually bear fruit in your life. Not that I'm just sitting up here running off my mouth for nothing, laboring in vain. Next thing you know, you're gonna be like demons. Demons forsaken me. I'm alone. Like you look at Paul. Paul's end of uh, end of his ministry. Paul starts off in Acts chapter 13. Paul and company. Paul and company. You act. You come to old man Paul on a deathbed. Only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Look over Apostle John. The guy's on a solitary confinement. Island of Patmos by himself. Isolation. So it's interesting. I like to be a picture of the church age. You know, it's going to get slim. Start out, man, I'm in big mega churches. 5,000 people. Next thing you know, you start getting in the Bible. Yeah, I'm like, you know, not lining up here. Not lining up here either. Get slimmer and slimmer. Oh, well, come on now, you know. We got to get the money rolling in. We got to get these big fancy lights and big fancy rock concerts and everything. And, and you know your company gets small. Only Luke is with me. You might have one guy next to you. So that's something interesting. Though. But uh, Paul said he didn't want, want his labor to be in vain. All right, now verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, they were unmovable. Praise the Lord. That's a great thing. Okay? And charity. Okay, that's a good thing. You look at your, your fellow Christians that, 
that they see you may be going through trouble, but they but they they still have faith in you. They still hold true to the promises of God. Okay, you didn't knock their faith by what you're going through. Good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desire to greatly see us, as we also to see you. They were steadfast. They were immovable. They want to see Paul, whether he's in jail, whether what he's going through, all his perils and troubles. He wants to see him. They're praying for him. They're, they're in remembrance of him. That's what, how we should all be like that at the end of the day. And uh, look at verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in, uh, in all our afflictions and distress. How were they comforted? By your faith. Seeing their faith comforted the Apostle Paul and stuff. They, they didn't move. They didn't budge. Now, uh, and he says in, uh, in verse 8, you know what? Let me pause there for a minute. Therefore, brethren, we are comforted over you in all our distress and, and uh, affliction and distress. Come to 2 Corinthians 11, just to brush up on it. I'm sure familiar with this, but just to get an idea on what Paul went through. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. You know, people are always, you know, boasting about all the, the success, okay? All their successful achievements, and I did this, and... You know, I, I, I went to church and I missed a day. I read my Bible. I got, you know, 50,000 Sunday school attendance and just all these, these things. I got big properties and all these achievements. But really, when you look at the Apostle Paul, look what he was bragging and boasting about. That's what's hard, you know. Men, we're all guilty. We like to brag and boast about things. Now, I'm guilty about that, 100%. But look at the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Aram? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Paul says, I'm way more of a minister of Christ than they are. What's he do? Does he brag about all his successful things here? Look at it. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. I lost count how many times I've been whipped. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. More frequent. In deaths off. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thirty-nine stripes at least, that was the Jewish law. He received that five times. The mathematician was thirty-nine times five. He had whip marks all on his back. 195. 195. Good job, Jerry. That's why you're calling copies. Alright, he received how many stripes? Save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day, I've been in the deep. Man, that was wild. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathens, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. I know Christians would give you a hard time. False people, false Christians, name only Christians. Verse 27. In weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things of without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I still got a burden for all the churches. I'm still trying to take care of the best I can. Who is weak? And, I, and, I'm, uh, and I'm not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed evermore, knoweth I lie not. That guy had a lot of troubles and afflictions and persecutions. And, and, and Paul says that, you know, in all those Thessalonians, we come back to 1 Thessalonians 3, they weren't moved by all that. They weren't moved by all that at all. They were, uh, they were, they were established. They were taking a stand. And that's the good definition of apostasy, is that you fall away from a standing position. You know, you take a stand for certain things. King James Bible, salvation by grace through faith and finished works of Christ. Pre-tribulation rapture. Next thing you know, people start working over on you, and then you start falling back a little bit. Start, you know, so called backslide, okay? And then you don't take the stand like how you used to take it. Praise the Lord for all the Christians that actually take a stand in things, especially in this day and age. Look at verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 3 8. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Now, Paul really, what that means, he, they're, they're really living. They're really living the life in Christ. Paul said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. While I'm here, it's, it's necessary that. I, I do the work of the Lord the best I can. That's a, that's a true life. You know the old expression, man, he's really living. No, you ain't. You're not really living if you don't got Christ. All that stuff. You know, what's a man? You gain the whole world and you lose his soul. You know, all these achievements that you do. And he, like Solomon, he, all this stuff that he did, and he left it back for generations just to destroy. You know, look at the founding fathers, you know. 
doing all this, I keep doing all this nice stuff, it's just gonna get wrecked. You know, it just takes one one group of riders to go in there and multi cocktail down the whole building or something. You know, it just just a lot of it's banned. But that's 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 no good. Let's look at verse uh, nine. That's really living. Living is in Christ. Okay, that's the main purpose to get out of that. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. But it, it does. It quenches the spirit when when you see other Christians not not they know it. And yet they're not they're not doing the best that they can. They're not really trying. Nobody's gonna be perfect. No way in the world. That's why you come to church with a bunch of unperfect people here. People come to church saying you're a bunch of hypocrites. Nobody would we never claim to be perfect. We have a perfect savior. Boast about him to dwell inside of us. But to really live is to give glory to God. Do the you know be busy about your father's business. Be busy about what the Lord got for you. That's the Father in heaven. Like verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again to you? For the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. In other words, they can't thank God enough the way that they turned out the way they did. They weren't just like a bunch of duds. Right? You work in and work on them and they just never really amount to nothing. Like the Lord says, some produce 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. It's a good thing to see Christians that are that are on fire to, to serve the Lord, to get busy. That's why I always think of Pastor Stokes, you know. Uh, first thing, you know, always giving you opportunities to do something. You want a song lead? You want to come up here and sing some special music? You want to preach on Wednesday night? Go for it. Always pushing you to, to, to do something. And that's what we all need. We all need that little that little push to get out there. Get in it, you know. That's how you, that's how you learn it. Very thankful for that. Look at verse 10. Here's a big thing. Night and day praying exceedingly. Recommend all Christians, they should have a prayer list. Okay? They should have a prayer list. A lot of times we forget. I'm going to write that down. I forget everything. I don't know. I'm young as I am. I forget everything. i got to write that stuff down. You gotta take notes. I gotta type it on my phone or something like that. That's gonna do. You gotta just take notes. You gotta have a prayer list. I encourage that. Okay. Get your get your little get your little notepad around. Write down that thing before you know before you go to bed. Whenever you're morning, whenever's convenient time, best thing time of the day for you. Take that thing out and start praying over it. So you don't you don't miss people. You know. Night and day praying exceedingly. Not just saying prayers. You gotta emphasize that every time. You know, our Father in heaven, I'll be named, I can come, you know, flip the rosary beads and all that. I'm how Mary, full grace, blessed be, fruit of the and all that. No. Mm -mm. Okay? Say, uh, praying, see, that's out of the heart. Now, let's look at this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. That we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You're going to try to help them anything that they need. Now, look at verse 11. Um, now, God himself and our Father... And our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? Is that three gods? No, that's one God. What that's called? That's called a, a hendiadi. That's three. That's say, that's a triple hendiadi. That's saying three, three names, but it's all talking about one person. Okay, you know that's a, that's the thing you got to get down to. It's, a, it's the way of speech. God Himself, and our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord. What's that make four of them? <laughs> no, it's one God. Okay, one God manifested in three persons. Um, make you to increase and abound in love. So here's the thing. There's, uh, here, here's Paul's prayer. It has six things in it. Okay. He prays on one to see them again. It's always great to see other saved Christians in fellowship. That's always wonderful. He prays to see them again. Uh, number two, to perfect their faith in parts which they are lacking. Three, for the Lord to direct his way to them. Four, for the Lord to increase their love one for another. It's always to pray to increase our love one for another. That's fellow Christians. And then, five, for the Lord to increase their love toward all men. It's not to, have, not, not to say to have fellowship with all men. Have no fellowship with the fruits of unrighteousness, but rather reprove them. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers, but rather be separate, be ye holy, and all that. We know about all that. But you got to love a lot of lost people. Why? If you don't really love them, you're not you're gonna, uh, off to hell. See you later, you know. No, you gotta love the lost world to, to give them the gospel in that sense to get them saved. And again, you can't be you hang around with them too much when they start rubbing off on you. you got it, that's the purpose of hanging around with, with good Christians, okay? Or else you better watch out. People are always influencing you, always peer pressure. Young people, you gotta watch out for that stuff. No means no, yes means yes. Be absolute. Don't let people work you over, take a stand. And that's that's what you gotta be like, you know? And uh, so he says, uh, verse 12, And the Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another, 
and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Now here's the key. Uh, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. When's that going to happen? Paul says, to the end. Happen at the end. Nobody's going to be unblameable, okay, right now. No way in the world. Uh, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, when? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Coming back with all his saints. Kisses them out. Tom and Jacob trouble comes back with them. Okay? And he, it's interesting that, look at that chapter though. Chapter 3. Look how he ends it. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, verse 19. Are ye not, are even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Alright, look at chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for a son from heaven. You notice that. There's the theme of the Thessalonians already. Paul gives them a lot of practical things. He always ends it off with his conclusion statement that the Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. Now, uh, just two more verses I want to get through. Just look at... Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 about uh, being preserved blameless. Alright? That's what we talked about a little bit earlier. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is that one day you're going to have a body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Jo John says, you know, Beloved, we know not uh, what we shall be, but when we shall see Him, we shall be like Him. Or we shall see Him as He is. Okay, We shall be like Him. Well, what was He like? He was perfect. He was sinless. He was in a glorified body. Uh, not right now. Right now our soul and spirit are saved, but we still got the, the, the other tri-party nature of us, our body. That's the whole purpose of the rapture. Put this on. Put this corruptible body that breaks down and dies and rots and, and all that. Put that off so you can raise an incorruptible body. Look at 1 Thessalonians. Same book. Was it 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Verse 23. In the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. That's your preserving God. Thank the Lord that you know you can't just mess up and God takes back that gift of salvation. You're gonna mess up all the time, but it's how you get back up, how you bounce back up. Do you acknowledge it? Do you acknowledge it, or do you just get a sense of self pity? You know, do you not say, Lord, I need help with this? And I'm going to keep, keep fighting like a good soldier. I'm not going to just cower down to all of my problems. I'm going to try to do the best I can through your power. you got to lean on Him. you got to trust on Him. But at the end of the day, He's going to sanctify you wholly, your whole being, your body, soul, and spirit. You'll be blameless one day. You'll be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, another one in Romans 8.29. We'll be through Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. Now here's our destination. This is this, this the whole thing of predestination. This isn't predestinated to get saved or nothing. This isn't Calvinism or anything. Here's our destination. Look at Romans 8.29. Right after the verse where, where it says we know that all things work together for good. Look what he says in verse 29. Here's a good thing. Here's how, here's how you can understand how is this going to work out for good, Lord. Look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. We're all one day going to be conformed to the exact image of his Son. If that isn't good, I don't know what it is. Okay? That's a good thing. So that's a good thing how we can think about how things, all things will work out to, to, for good. We know one day we'll be an incorruptible body. We'll be coming back with the Lord, like, like Paul says when, in First Thessalonians. Come back with the Lord and all his saints. So... Just to cap it off, you know, once again, Paul starts the chapter with very practical things. That's why 1 Thessalonians is a great book, a good practical book. And there's some doctrine in it. It talks about uh, the main doctrine of the entire Bible. And that's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the main thing. So, uh, in closing every chapter, Paul mentions the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what, what our hearts should be set on. That should be our, ble our blessed hope. And uh, like John prayed, even so, come Lord Jesus. You know, anybody that, that's comfortable with this world right now, they're backslidden. No other way to put it. If you're comfortable with this world, what, 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 come on, really? 
You know what? You wouldn't rather go to go home to, to heaven, go home to glory, so all the problems are solved, no more pain, all that. Yeah, I mean, come on. That's the, what we should be looking for. Is the, is the coming of our Lord. So let's just uh, let's uh, bow our heads and we'll sing a song. Uh, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much, Lord, for your for your word, Lord, that we can just get uh, a lot of things from it, Lord, a lot of edification. I do pray that that your word just uh, sinks into the hearts of those here, Lord. That once again, Lord, that we don't just be hearers of the world, Lord, but doers, Lord. Allow us to fulfill this stuff and, and really trust in you, really claim your promises that are to us, Lord. And increase our faith, Lord, where it's lacking. And, um, and, and only you can do that, Lord. And just um, all the troubles and afflictions that we do go through in life, Lord, I pray that we... Uh, we go through them with the, with the right attitude, Lord. And uh, I'd much rather go through trials and troubles and tribulations with you than uh, by myself, Lord. That's for sure. And uh, I pray that we stand strong and just uh, give us just strong shoulders to carry the burdens, Lord. We know that the burdens may not be light, but we pray for strong shoulders to carry those burdens, Lord. We, we need that. And just strengthen us, Lord, spiritually, uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally. In this uh, just crazy world that we're living in, this present evil world, and just um, allow us to just be busy for you, keep our eyes focused on you. That's our that's our destination. Allow us to be far sighted and uh, and just stay busy for you, Lord. Bear more fruits for you that uh, that we do what's pleasing in your sight, not to fulfill our flesh all the time, but to put that thing down and uh, just just worship you and, and just give you all the praise and glory and uh, help us all grow, Lord, in, in the knowledge and wisdom of your word. And once again, Lord, we thank you for dying on the cross and, and shedding your blood and resurrecting the third day, Lord, to save our souls. And uh, we're grateful for that, Lord. And we just give you all praise and glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.